Hello, this is Amy. Welcome to Ask Dr. Amy. Today our topic is asthma. And like all my videos, this is for information purposes only. It's not medical advice because I don't know your or your child's specific medical history and it's not connected to any hospital or organizations I might work for. All right, we're headed into winter and that is traditionally a tough time for kids with asthma, at least in North America. For asthma in kids, asthma season or the time when people have issues or exacerbations is very seasonal. So if we look at it roughly over a year, the rates are lowest in the summer, as you can see, and are higher in the winter. This is because the triggers of asthma in kids are very seasonal. The cold air itself can be a trigger. Coldness is irritating to lungs that are already sensitive, which we'll talk about more in a second. With the change in season also comes the virus season. So your common cold, for example, or a longer illness like the flu. The viruses themselves are usually not that big of a deal, and with time, the body will get over the infection, especially if the person is otherwise healthy. But in kids with asthma, it can be dangerous as a trigger to bring on the worst asthma symptoms or a severe attack. So kids who have asthma when they're well controlled should do well at baseline without frequent symptoms and definitely without frequent attacks. But since viral respiratory infections are some of the biggest triggers of exacerbation in kids, we see a lot more of that in the winter. And something else that kicks off asthma season for us is in the fall, school starts. So for younger kids, that's when they go into the petri dish of school and pick up the viruses. And for older kids, a lot of times athletic training begins around this time. And in school aged or older kids who have asthma, a lot of times it can be triggered by exercise. So these are big seasonal triggers. Oh, and there's actually one more, which is seasonal allergies. I forgot to include that because that's not necessarily following the graph that I have here. For many people, the transition between fall and winter is a bad allergy time, but this varies a bit more from person to person, so it's hard to say. And then we have to think about the common triggers that are not related to time of year. Smoking is a big one. Secondhand smoke is just as harmful as the asthmatic patient, him or herself, smoking. Sometimes parents will say they only smoke outside, which Technically, I guess it's better than inside where the child is, but not really because the smoke that lingers on clothing, on hair, furniture, or the inside of the car is just as harmful. The particles from the smoke are invisible, but they linger and they can still enter into the lungs and they can cause the same asthma flares. So please, please, if there's a child with asthma, especially around you, there's a huge reason to stop smoking. Another category, not really a trigger, but something to keep in mind, is kids who have some sort of chronic lung disease. It's another group of people to remember they're more prone to asthma symptoms. This can be previous NICU babies who needed breathing tubes or some breathing help that predisposes the lungs to inflammation. So kids who have that, they have a double whammy, so they are affected by the seasonal triggers, but it can be even worse for them. The symptoms can be more difficult to treat, they can last longer, and their lungs can be overall more sensitive. All right, let's talk about what asthma is. It's a condition of the lungs. The symptoms come from the lungs itself. It's not caused by an infection. It's triggered by it. The symptoms itself come from inside the organ. It's a disease of inflammation. Inflammation is a complex system of responses that our body has to a stimulus. For example, when you get a bug bite, the bug punctures the skin and may or may not leave a little bit of something behind, but the reason the area gets a bump, gets red and itchy, is because of the body's inflammatory response to that bite, and not because of the bite itself. This is a very important part of our immune system and it protects us, but it can be too strong, and asthma is an example of that. Other conditions that are related to inflammation include having allergies or the skin condition eczema. And there's a reason that they are considered the cousins of asthma and they often appear as a trio. The reactions causing them are inflammatory and they're similar. So it makes sense that the same person might be prone to having all of them. So the symptoms of asthma, which are difficulty breathing, chest tightness, coughing, they're all caused by inflammation and we'll see the mechanism in just a second. But first I wanted to make a technical point that asthma is a diagnosis is only given to kids who are two years old or older. Kids who are younger can definitely have asthma-like symptoms for the exact same reasons, but for the sake of definition, we don't call it that unless it becomes enough of a pattern to keep happening after two. This difference is not for a predictive 
prognostic value. It's not to say that the first episode, if it happens after two years old, they will definitely keep getting it, or it will definitely be worse or more severe. But I just want you to know there's another name we use for younger kids, which is reactive airway disease. Just between you and me, I think reactive airway disease is a better name for asthma in general because it's way more descriptive. It's kind of like the generic name and the brand name. Asthma is a more popular word, but it always is a reactive airway disease caused by the airways being more reactive, no matter at what age. So just keep in mind, you can always call asthma a reactive airway disease. You're just more likely to see that term instead of asthma if the patient is very young. All right, enough with definitions. We can get carried away talking about this because medicine likes to use special obscure words that we have to define. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens exactly in the airways. All right, in the tree of our lungs or the airways, you go from the big trunks into progressively smaller branches. The large pipe coming down the trachea, dividing into the left and right bronchus or bronchi, plural. You can think of them like large, wide highways of a city. So you keep going and turn off the highway and get into smaller, or the highway becomes progressively smaller roads. Eventually you get to the neighborhood, you have local streets, and you arrive at the small clusters of structures like houses on the street. And these are called alveoli. If we zoom into one of them, a single one is called an alveolus. It's like an air sac that can expand and shrink. This is where air exchange happens. This is why we breathe. We're not going to make it too complicated and talk about the blood vessels around there and how the gases diffuse across. Let's just stay on the airway side, the highway transportation system, going from the interstate to the house. And this system in the lungs has two jobs. Number one, the carbon dioxide from the body ends up in the alveolus here and needs to be breathed out when we exhale. On the other hand, when we inhale, oxygen goes down the big freeways, down to the littler streets, ends up in the alveolus. And that's where it has to end up before it can get into our bloodstream. So for our purposes in the lungs, it's important to keep this system open, both so that the carbon dioxide can get out and the oxygen can get in. So asthma or reactive airway disease happens at the level of the local streets, not the big highways. We say it's a small airway disease. Let's take a cross section, basically a cut here at one of the branches, which is called a bronchial, which means it's smaller than a bronchus. And let's look through it like we're looking through a pipe. In the normal lung, this pipe has these few layers. You have a ring of smooth muscle. So smooth muscles contract without us being able to consciously control it. It's controlled by a complicated mechanism, just like we don't have to think about having the muscles in our gut push the fo food forward. In the same way, we can't really control if the smooth muscle around our airways, how relaxed they are or how constricted they are. Inside the smooth muscle layer, there's a layer of mucosa with a membrane lining the inside of the pipe. This whole structure is a very important part of the lungs. And the mucosa is very complicated with many things embedded in it. Together, the mucosa and all the glands in it act like the air humidifier, the warning system, the emergency response, and the cleaning headquarters of the lungs. On the epithelial layer lining the mucosa, there's also cilia, which are these tiny little self-moving hairs that are like brooms to sweep things up and out of the lungs. Basically, it's a wonderfully complex system that when working well, is self-cleansing and self-protecting. When we smell smoke, many of us start coughing. That's a natural response of this system because it detects the smoke particles, which is a foreign object, and the system coordinates to grab it with mucus and make you cough it out. And coughing involves the smooth muscle layer, which, by the way, controls the diameter of the pipe. And in asthma, this system becomes a little bit out of control. So let's see what it looks like. We have the same layers, but they look very different. The smooth muscle layer is more activated, it's thicker, it's constricting. The mucosal layer is thicker as well and swollen. And here I'm going to use this yellow color to show the extra mucus secreted into the airway. This is phlegm or sputum. The healthy airway also has sputum. Like we mentioned before, it's part of that cleansing mechanism to grab something that needs to leave and basically pull it out when we cough. But usually it's not very much and it's not overly triggered. It shouldn't bother us too much. So just to review the things we just talked about, the smooth muscle layer gives us extra bronchial spasm. Bronchial, which is the airway, and spasm is spasm. So clamping down, which changes the diameter of the airway to make the pipe narrower. The mucosal layer is swollen, 
further limiting the area that the air can pass through. And then lastly, there's a flood of a lot of mucus sputum. And look at that opening we have left. It becomes very small and restricted. This restriction becomes a particular problem during the exhale of a breath. This is the part of asthma that's not very intuitive because when you look at someone in an attack, it can be hard to tell because they're just struggling to breathe in general. But the actual problem is on the way out, the airways collapse and the air gets trapped behind, back in the lungs, and it cannot get out. This has to do with the physics of breathing, and it has to do with how the flow of air affects the airway around it. But the reason is not very important for us to get too into right now. We just have to remember we can't exhale. Air is trapped. If we look at x-rays of lungs, in the normal lung, the shape is something like this. Obviously, this is not an anatomically correct drawing. But the idea is, in people who have asthma, when you compare them, the shape becomes more boxy and square-like because it's overinflated. It's like a more taut balloon. Remember we said before that air has to exchange in the lungs. It has to be a two-way street. Oh, that's a perfect metaphor. As things have to go from the highway to the house and from the house to the highway. Congestion on one side affects the other one as well. So when there's a lot of trapped air, which is higher in carbon dioxide, it's harder for the oxygen to get in for purely mechanical reasons. The airways are narrow to begin with, and the trapped air takes up more room inside, so it takes more force and effort to pull in the air. That's why during an asthma attack, the patients are panting and breathing hard, and this is not sustainable. Asthma becomes dangerous when that process to compensate fails. If somebody is having just slight symptoms or starting to work up into an exacerbation, in the beginning, if you watch them closely, you can notice that the breathing out becomes more difficult first. It's taking longer than usual to exhale. And wheezing, which is this high-pitched sound in the lungs that we hear with asthma, comes from the sound of air trying to move through a smaller pipe. All right, so all three of these symptoms are a result of the inflammation, an overdrive of the lungs' natural mechanisms. So what can we do about it in an attack? Depending on the severity of the symptoms, the treatment can vary. But there are three basic ideas, basic mainstays of treatment. Albuterol, the inhaled medicine, is a bronchial dilator. Again, bronchial means the airway and dilator means dilating. So it tries to relax the smooth muscle grip here and open up the airway, physically making more room. We also use steroids to decrease inflammation. And this is usually either through an IV or medicine by mouth during the asthma attack. And depending on how severe it is, there are different strengths of steroids to use as well. And steroids don't specifically target just the lungs, but it's effective in decreasing inflammation overall. So we usually use a short burst of a few days during an attack to decrease the amount of inflammation in the body. Then in terms of the extra mucus, to some degree it's already being treated with the other two categories of medicines. Albuterol opens up the airway more, so it's easier for the mucus to move through and be coughed up. Steroids decreasing inflammation will also decrease the mucus production, since it was an inflammatory response that led to the flooding. And then something we do in the hospital we call chest physiotherapy, or chest PT, is a fancy word for what your mom does when you're coughing, which is patting you on the back. It's using that mechanical force to help break up the thick mucus, shake it around a little bit, and help you cough it up. Patients who have cystic fibrosis, who always have problems with a lot of thick mucus, they use that electrical vest that vibrates to help shake up the mucus a few times a day. It's the same principle. These are some of the basic and first line things that we use to help someone with an asthma attack. Hopefully this is enough. If they need more than this, we can make a video just on some of the bigger guns in treating really bad asthma attacks. But those are fortunately less frequent. And actually what makes a difference is how this patient is managed leading up to this attack. Asthma is a chronic disease, so we looked at some of the common things to do during an attack, but it's also very important to think about how to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis. And hopefully, if that management is well done, there should be fewer attacks. So the decision on the long-term management depends on severity. And there's a specific way, a chart, to qualify for this objectively. But the main elements to consider are things like how bad are the exacerbations that this patient has? How many have they had recently? How many times have they been hospitalized for it? And even if they don't have these bad, severe attacks, how much do symptoms persist when they are well? For example, 
Are they still wheezing and not able to exercise or coughing all the time at night when they're not in a bad attack? These all go into the algorithm to decide what type of severity they have. But there are also other things to consider too in deciding the long-term treatment. What are their triggers? Is it possible to avoid them? Sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes the kid with asthma cannot leave an environment with cigarette smoke. Sometimes their allergies are so bad that even on maximum treatment, they still get triggered into asthma attacks. Another factor is family. Is there a strong family history of bad asthma? You wouldn't put a kid on maximum controller therapy just because his or her parents have bad asthma. So it still depends on our patient, the symptoms and the history, but remember that family history is important to consider and to know. All right, let's talk about the treatment in a nutshell. If their asthma is well controlled or just not very severe to begin with maybe, they can just take an albuterol when they feel the symptoms or they're about to be exposed to a trigger like exercise. We should talk about what their triggers are and some strategies for avoiding them. And in this not severe green zone by definition, they should pretty much only have symptoms very occasionally. But as the profile becomes more severe, we go to controller medications that your child would take every day, no matter how they feel. This is usually in the form of an inhaled corticosteroid. This is different from that oral medicine or the intravenous medicine that we give during attacks. It's a much smaller dose because of the way it's delivered. It's breathed in instead of swallowed or injected. And it really has to be taken very consistently, even if there are no symptoms, because the goal is to lower the long-term inflammation overall to prevent persistent symptoms or very bad attacks. That's why the consistent use, regardless of whether or not they have respiratory symptoms that day, is very important. And this is not a black and white forever thing. It's a treatment that can be stopped and started depending on what the child needs. Some things to consider, some patients only need it during certain seasons around their trigger time, and then they don't need it for the rest of the year. Sometimes with age, many people grow out of their childhood asthma. So after not seeing many symptoms for a while, The controller medication can be weaned back and see how they do, and many can be weaned off as they get older. And lastly, the symptoms. Sometimes the inhaled steroids can be increased on top of the normal daily controller dose when the symptoms start brewing, just a little extra kick to stop the exacerbation in its tracks. And with the doses of these controller medications, it's possible to go up and down on the dose or try some bigger guns. But by and large, in childhood asthma, These are our mainstays of treatment for long-term control. So this is our super fast, zoomed out overview of childhood asthma and reactive airway disease. When it's well controlled, kids can do very well with it, play sports normally, have good lung function, and basically do whatever they want. But it is something to take very seriously because on the other hand, bad control can lead to very severe exacerbations and it's possible to die from such an episode even with maximum care. I hope this answers some of your general questions about asthma. If you like the video, please subscribe to the channel. And if you have further questions about this or you want to see a more in-depth explanation of something, please leave me a comment, let me know, and I'll see you next time.